21st Precinct, Sergeant Klein. Yes, ma'am. Case. It isn't gas. What's the address? This one. You are in the muster room at the 21st Precinct. On what? The nerve center. Call is coming in. You will follow the actions taken pursuant to that call from this minute until the final report is written in the 124 room at the 21st Precinct. All right, ma'am. You'll have assistance there right away. Yes, ma'am, right away. Twenty-first precinct. It's just lines on a map of the city of New York. Most of the hundred and seventy-three thousand people wedged into the nine-tenths of a square mile between Fifth Avenue and the East River wouldn't know if you asked them that they lived or worked in the twenty-first. Whether they know it or not, the security of their persons, their homes, and their property is my job. My job and the job of the hundred and sixty patrolmen, eleven sergeants, and four lieutenants of whom I'm the boss. My name is Kennelly, Frank Kennelly. I'm captain in command of the 21st. What makes a city? Not buildings, not subways, not business. People make a city. From dawn to midnight, from midnight to dawn, the rich and the poor and the good and the bad pour their lives together and stir up the city, as in the 21st. I was out of the precinct on my way to division headquarters. There was a meeting of precinct commanders in connection with new regulations for the supervision of cabarets and dance halls. It was 8.38 a.m. when the radio call went out. 21 precinct, 5313 and 314. The address 614 East 76th Street on the second floor. All right, turn around, Johnny. Let's take a look. Emergency squad and ambulance responding to... When we turned into 76, I could see we had plenty of men on the job. Two sector cars from the precinct were in front of 614, an old law tenement. So was the sergeant's car. Ahead of them were the emergency service car and an ambulance. You stay with the car, Johnny. Police officer. Excuse me. Coming through there. Police officer. Well, what have we got, Coley? Oh, a couple of kids, Captain. Gas case? Well, stay back, folks. There's nothing to see. Nobody's been down since I was posted here, Captain. I haven't heard anything. Thanks. Oh, uh, Coley, stop in and see me after the tour, will you? Yes, sir. Now stand back there, folks. There's nothing to see. It's all The house was no better, no worse than a thousand others like it. No cleaner, no dirtier. Even at that time of the morning, you could smell cabbage cooking. Somebody's always cooking cabbage. It's cheap. At the top of the stairs, the cop was posted in front of the rear flat on the second floor. All the neighbors had been shooed back behind their own doors. In the kitchen, a young woman, her hair in curlers and wearing a faded house coat, sat in the corner sobbing. In the other room, the ESD men and the ambulance surgeon were laboring desperately with respirator equipment. Sergeant Burns was standing in the doorway between the two rooms. What have we got, Sergeant? Two kids? Yes, sir. Is that the mother? Yeah. They're twins. Two boys, nine weeks old. Well, how are they? I don't think it looks good. Let me try for a pulse again here. Yes, sir. That's good. Hold it there. All right. Where's the father? He was a corporal in the Air Force. Killed in the crash in Alaska seven or eight months ago. Oh. She said that since she brought the twins home from the hospital, she'd been keeping them in a couple of dresser drawers. These. She said she puts the two drawers on the table at night right next to each other. Mm -hmm. Each of the twins got wrapped in tight in a blanket in his own drawer. Then she uses this yellow blanket across the top of both the drawers. That's what knocked them out. Blanket on top. What's her name? Lucas. Mrs. Ruth Lucas. Let's talk to her, Sergeant. Mm -hmm. Look, Doc. Not very good, Sergeant. Come on. Mrs. <laughs> Lucas. This is Captain Canelli. Oh, my baby. They're dead, I'm sorry. The doctor and the emergency squad are trying to save them. The respirator's still working. Poor little baby. <laughs> We'd like to find out how this thing happened, Miss Lucas. If you want, I don't care. I was just... 
going out today to buy a trip for them. I cut out an ad from the mirror last night. At Kimball, for having a sale on baby things. I was going down there today. The ad's in my pocketbook in there if you want to see it. No, 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 sorry. If you don't mind, I think I ought to have my pocketbook anyway. I cashed my check from the government yesterday. There's a hundred dollars in my pocketbook. More than a hundred. Where is your pocketbook? In there on the dress. Would you get it, Sonny? Yes, sir. What do we get? How much do you get from the government, Miss Lucas? All together, you mean? Yeah, all together. From both Social Security and the pension, it comes to about $145. A month? Yes, a month. That's for me and the baby. Mm -hmm. As soon as the checks come, I pay the rent. That's what I did yesterday, the rent and the little bill at the candy store. There's about $100 left. Is this it? Yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. Did you... Did you talk to the doctor? Is there any chance? You know. He was busy. Oh. As long as you've uh, got your pocketbook, Miss Lucas, you said you wanted to show me that ad. Oh, oh, yeah. I was going to get Mrs. Gonzalez to come and stay with him this morning while I went downtown. She stays with him when I have to go out. It's very nice for me. He lives upstairs on the fourth floor. This is the ad. It was in the mirror. Mm -hmm. All your money there? Oh, yeah, I'm sure it is. Well, maybe you ought to look anyway. There's been a lot of people walking through here this morning. Yeah, it's all here. <laughs> it's a funny time to be worrying about money. I'm sorry. Well, you've always got to worry about money. Weather's been pretty warm out, Miss Lucas. Seems to me you have them wrapped up in a lot of blankets. They've got to be kept warm. They're still so young. It was a blanket for each, the blue ones. I always wrap those around them. And then I always put the yellow one over the top of the drawers, you know? Did you tuck it in under the drawers, the yellow blanket? Yeah, it never touched them. That's why I can't understand how it happened. It never came more than this close to them. It was just to keep away any draft. And there was at least this much open space over their heads. The only thing I can figure is they're getting so they can kick a little. One of them must have kicked it, you know. You uh, put them to bed last night? Yes. About six o'clock, and then about eight, Mrs. Conjuris came. Stayed with him for a couple of hours. Where were you? I went out with a friend of mine. Where? You know, around we went to a movie. We went and had some pizza and a bottle of beer. Girlfriend? No, man. Well, I met after Harry died. What's his name? Why? Oh, I just wanted to know. Oh, Dan. Dan Torbert. Where is he now? Work, I guess. He's a mechanic. He works for a taxi company. What taxi company? Ace, something like that. I don't know. Where does he live? Up town in the Bronx. I don't see what he has to do with it. He had nothing to do with it. He's just a friend of mine. That's all. Oh. Could you hand me that box of tissues, please? Yeah, sure. Thanks. <laughs> I don't get it. I just don't. The, the babies were all right when I came home. Mrs. Gonzalez takes good care of them. She said she changed them, and she gave them a bottle about 11.30, and they went off to sleep again. I just don't get it. Uh, what time did Dan bring you home, Miss Lucas? Oh, I don't know exactly. It was... Before midnight, I think. A little before midnight. Did he come upstairs with you? Why? Oh, well, just wanted to know. Sure, he came up. He sat a while after Mrs. Gonzalez left. Mm -hmm. What did you talk about? Dad and me, you mean? Yeah. Nothing in particular. Just talk, that's all. You, uh, you got up this morning about 8.30. That's kind of late for the mother of two infants to get up, isn't it? I never set the alarm. The babies are my alarm clock. They usually wake up about six o'clock or so, and I hear them cry. Poor kids. I don't get it. Sergeant. Yeah, Doc? Can I see you a minute? Oh, sure. Captain? Okay. Excuse me, Miss Lucas. I'll be right back. Well, how's it look? Captain Canelli, Dr. Mastico. Glad to know you. Yeah. Well, they're both dead. They were DOA. It wasn't even any use trying. You have any idea what the cause of death was? I don't know. It wasn't anything external. Probably suffocation. 
I'm going to pack up. You'll notify the medical examiner, huh, Sergeant? Yeah. Yeah, sure. I'm sorry. There wasn't anything that could be done. I know. Yeah. Excuse me. I've got to pack up. Rough deal, Captain. Yeah. After you call the M.E., Sergeant, notify the detectives. Tell them we've got two suspicious deaths. Possible homicide. you're in the job, the easier it is to do the hard things. But there's one thing that never gets easier. That's telling a mother her kid is dead. I told Mrs. Ruth Lucas that both of hers were dead. I left Sergeant Burns in charge with instructions to wait for the arrival of the medical examiner and the detectives. Sector men were ordered to resume patrol. On the way downstairs, I thought of a squeal I investigated as a detective before the war. A mother, a girl from a good, hard-working family, couldn't stand her baby crying day and night. She grabbed him by the throat and strangled him. That was messier, but the twins were just as dead. She did. She did. I tell you, she did. All right, lady. You'll get a chance to tell your story. Oh, hello, Captain. Captain? Are you the captain? Yes, that's right. Coley, keep the people moving. Yes, sir. Now, look. Kill those babies. I know it. That's a very serious accusation, ma'am. I'm making it. What's your name? And Mrs. Gonzalez, Mrs. Mary Gonzalez. Are you the woman who stayed with the babies last night? That's right. I stayed with them all the time. I loved those babies. She had no use for them. No use at all. Well, that doesn't mean she killed them, Mrs. Gonzalez. Oh, don't it? She wanted to marry this Dan Corbett, but he didn't want any ready-made family. She told me that herself. Uh, when did she tell you that? Oh, last night. Before that, even. Look, uh, Mrs. Gonzalez, I'd like you to talk to the detectives who are handling this. Have you got time to come to the station house now? Right now? I'll give you a lift in my car. Oh, I was just going out to the butcher. All right. And the detectives will come around to see you. Oh, I'll go. I'll go now. Okay. Come on. Oh, uh, don't forget to stop in, Coley. Uh, yes, sir. I love those babies. Couldn't have loved them more if they were my own grandchildren. And I got two grandchildren in Jersey City. What time did she get home last night? It was after midnight, way after midnight. Well, Miss Lucas said it was before midnight. Oh, oh, thank you. It was after. I came at 8 o'clock and gave me a dollar and a quarter for five hours. That goes to show you I love those babies. Station house, Johnny. Wouldn't mind children for that unless I loved them. And I was always bringing them things. Toys and clothes and things like that. She, uh, told me that Dan Corbett came home with her last night, Miss Gonzalez. Yes, I pronounce it Gonzalez. I'm not Spanish, you see. That was my husband's name, my second husband's name. Rest his soul. Did they, uh, say anything in your presence? Well, no. When they came, she just gave me the dollar and a quarter and I went upstairs. But I could smell liquor on her breath. Was she drunk? Well... She'd been drinking. I could see that. And I could see she didn't love them. I loved them. I spent more money on them than she ever paid me. A lot more. She killed them. I know she killed them. She was much too The woman continued talking all the way to the station house. She told me everything she knew and everything she suspected. She ran the gamut from fact to rumor to guess. When we got there, I took her upstairs to the office of Lieutenant Matt King, who commanded the 21st Detective Squad. Then I walked down the rickety stairs through the back room. Two division plane closemen had a sharply dressed policy rider there prior to booking. The 124 man was posting the newest teletype alarm. I walked out into the muster room. Sergeant Klein on the boxes waved at me and I walked over. A couple of messages for you, Captain. Yeah. Call division headquarters. Okay. Uh, Mrs. Franklin called. She says she's president of the PS 181 Parent Teachers Association. Oh, yes. Uh, call her back, Sergeant, and tell her the order came through. We're posting a patrolman at that crossing before and after school beginning Monday. Yes, sir. And uh, Father Tanachi called and asked whether you'd like to speak to the boys' club this Wednesday or next Wednesday. Either date is open. Oh, well, what's did he prefer? He didn't say anything, Captain. All right, I'll call him. Oh, uh, get me division. Okay, Captain. This is the 21st Precinct, uh, Captain Kennelly to speak to Deputy Chief Inspector DeAndre. Where'd you take it, Captain? In your office? No, I'll take it here. 
Captain Canelli. Hello, Chief. Yes, sir. Yes. Well, I was on my way. I... Oh, well, we had what looks like a double homicide. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, I can come now. Oh. All right, Chief. I'll, I'll send my clerical man. Yes, sir. Right away. Sergeant, send McCarty up to division to get notes on the meeting of precinct commanders that just broke up. Yes, sir. I'll be in my office. 21st Precinct, Sergeant Klein. Sergeant Burns, number 614-76. Brains and the ME showed up. I turned it over to them. I'm going back on the street. Well, give the street my love. What's with you? The chief just chewed out the skipper. Oh, is that all? I'll see you. A precinct commander's job runs from A to Z and back again. During the morning, I approved the plans of the precinct youth patrolmen for neighborhood softball teams. I listened to a delegation from St. Anthony's on their application to close off 80th Street for a block party, and I wrote out my recommendation for departmental recognition of a patrolman. In the meantime, the investigation into the death of the twins continued. The bodies had been removed to Bellevue Morgue for autopsy. Detectives brought the mother to the station house for further interrogation by Lieutenant King. While she was upstairs, another detective brought in Dan Tobert. Lieutenant King preferred that he not see Miss Lucas at the moment, so Talbot was asked to wait in my office. While I signed reports, he sat there waiting for Lieutenant King to come downstairs and talk to him. Yes? You busy, Captain? Oh, uh, Coley, I'll be right out. Yes, sir. You sit here, Dan. How long will it be, do you know? Oh, won't be long. I don't like to miss the time on the job. All right, Coley. Hey, Captain, some, uh... A fellow who works in the laundry over on York Avenue playing Mrs. Gonzalez in the neighborhood gossip. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And detectives know about that. Look, Coley, a loan company in Flushing wrote in and said you were three payments behind on a note. He had sickness in the family and the bills piled up, Captain. I thought it was for a washing machine. Well, the note was, yes, sir, but she got sick afterwards. I'm going to get straightened out with him and pay day. I told him that. I'll see that you do. We don't want any more letters. Oh, uh, Coley. Yes, sir. Don't say you're going to take care of it and not do it. If you can't make it, let me know. Maybe I can call for you and get an extension. Yes, sir. Hello, Captain. Hi, Matt. Your man's in here. Oh, that's all, Coley. Yes, sir. I don't know what it looks like, man. Not very good for the mother. Go ahead. This is Dan Tolbert. Lieutenant King. That's all right. Sit still. Oh, thanks. What's the name, Kane? King. K-I-N-G. Lieutenant Matthew King. Oh. Uh, where's Ruth? Upstairs in the detective squad. Oh, she's not in jail? No, just in the office. Oh, uh, I thought somebody was kidding me when that detective came and told me what happened. I thought it was a joke. It would have been some joke. Well, my boss was sore. I had to leave. I was putting a new clutch in the car. It has to go on the street tonight. Well, we'll see if we can get you out of here fast. He wouldn't have do that to those kids. Must have been an accident. Accidents don't happen in pairs, not like that. I mean, Ruth wouldn't do anything like that. Was it all right if I smoke in here? That's one of mine. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Thanks a lot, Lieutenant. Thanks. I mentioned it. How long have you known Ruth? Oh, I don't know. Uh, five or six months, seven months, something like that. How'd you meet her? Well, I'll tell you the truth, it was in a bar and grill. I used to stop in there once in a while for a glass of beer. I saw her in there two or three times alone. Thought it was kind of funny, a pregnant girl coming into a bar alone like that. Yeah. I asked about her. Somebody told me. I don't know. I guess I felt kind of sorry for the kid. We got to talking one night, and that was that. You kept seeing her right up until the time she had the baby? Yeah. Yeah, it was funny. I'd visit her at the hospital. Some people around there thought I was a father. I didn't say nothing. I let them think what they wanted. And after she brought the kids home? It was just like before. I kept seeing her, taking her out, when she could get this Mrs. Gonzalez to sit, you know. I understand you talked about getting married. Well, who told you that, Ruth? Is it true? Uh, we talked about it, yeah. Can I have that ashtray, Captain? Yeah, sure. Thanks. But there uh, never was anything definite. Not one way or the other. What do you mean, not one way or the other? Well, there was a lot of problems. We both had our problems. The kids? Yeah, that plus the fact I'm not making a fortune, you know. I figured you get married, you want to enjoy each other for a little while anyway. There's time enough for kids a little later when you feel like settling down. And you'd probably have been married already if it wasn't for the kids. Oh, I wouldn't say that exactly, Lieutenant. Maybe, yeah, I don't know. Did you ever tell her that? 
Well, we talked about a pro and con from every angle. You know, if a guy's going to have a family, he'd much rather it be his own. That's a fact of life. You see, he gets some money from the government, doesn't he? Yes, yeah, she even went down and got the details from the VA or somebody. If she got married again, it'd be cut down to half or so. About 60 bucks a month for the twins. That's what she'd get. What'd you talk about when you brought her home last night, Dan? Oh, different things. About getting married? Yeah, it was mentioned. You told her you didn't want to see her anymore, isn't that right? Well, how'd you know that? Well, let's say I guessed it. Well, yeah, that's, that's true. I mean, the whole thing seemed kind of hopeless to me. I... I told her I'm a young guy and I don't want to take on somebody else's obligations. I could see it would only lead to trouble if I did that. That's exactly what I told her. If we got married, it could only lead to trouble. I'll tell you something, Danny. You didn't get married and it still led to trouble. The questioning went on for another 15 or 20 minutes. Drink last night, Dan. I sat there watching and listening. Interrogation is a great skill and Matt King knew his business. He was friendly, polite, and patient. Dan Torbert tried to be as helpful as he could without hurting Ruth. He was helpful, but he hurt her. Step by step, Lieutenant King was building a case of murder first against Ruth Lucas. At 4 p.m., I turned out the platoon for the night tour. At 4.10, Sergeant Klein came into my office for a conference in regard to tours off for accumulated days spent in court by men in his platoon. I guess that does it, Captain. Thanks. All right. Is the captain in there? Well, he's busy now, ma'am. Can you tell me what it's about? I want to see the captain. Well, I said the captain... That's all right, Sergeant. I'll talk to him. Come in, Miss Gonzalez. Uh, Certainly is hard to get some attention around here. That's all I can say. Certainly is hard. Sit down. No, thanks. I can stand. I gave a lot of time when Lieutenant King wanted to know all about everything this morning. Now I can't even see him. Well, I know that he's very busy this afternoon. Well, I gave my time when he wanted it. Did you uh, talk to any of these detectives upstairs? Maybe they can help you. Oh, sure. I talked to the detectives. But they said I'd have to talk to the lieutenant, and the lieutenant won't talk to me. What am I supposed to do? Well, what is it that you want? I just want my things, that's all. I gave a lot of things to those babies, and they're dead now. I want them to give to my own grandchildren. Should have given them to my own grandchildren in the first place. You'll get whatever is yours as soon as the investigation is over. Well, I just want to make sure they aren't turned over to some charity or something. After all, charity begins at home. Oh, well, I suggest you make a list of what you claim is yours. I don't need a list. I know. There were four pairs of little Johnny coats and a raffle for each one of them, and there was a rubber sheet. Oh, Mrs. Gonzalez, I'm there sure. Was a... Yes, come in. Excuse me, Captain. You said you wanted to ride over and take a look at conditions at First Avenue Playground after school. Yeah. No. Well, okay, I'll be right with you. Yes, sir. Oh, uh, Sergeant. Yes, sir. What time does the messenger leave for the distributing room tonight? About 5.30, Captain. All right, have him stop in here. I'll have these reports signed. Okay, Captain. And there was those two pillars. They're the most important. Two pillars with real down. Took me a whole day to make them, and you know how much down is. Real down. Well, you'll be able to get all of it back if it's yours. Well, it's definitely mine. I didn't give her anything. I only loaned it. The pillars couldn't be anything except loaning, because she didn't even know about them. I just put them in last night. You put them in where? In the drawers. Where'd you think? Those poor little babies sleeping in those hard drawers like that. It was a shame. Last night? That's right, just last night. I only finished them yesterday afternoon. I thought the babies would be a lot more comfortable. Well, didn't you say anything to Miss Lucas about the pillows? Well, I was going to mention it, but when I came downstairs to sit, I forgot to bring them. After she was gone, I went back upstairs for a minute to get the pillows. I was only gone a minute. I wouldn't leave those babies alone. When did you put the pillows in the drawers, Miss Gonzalez? When the babies woke up for their bottles, about 11.30. After I changed them, I put the pillows in the drawers. And how high are the pillows? What do you mean, how high? Oh, well, I mean, are they thick? Well, very thick. They're very good pillows, genuine down. And I want them back. You'll get them back. I guarantee you'll get them back. Well, as long as I have your guarantee. All right, let's go upstairs, Miss Gonzalez. Why? To see Lieutenant King. They told me he's very busy. We'll see him. In Lieutenant King's presence, I had Miss Gonzalez repeat her story about putting the and pillows in the drawers. She went through it word for word. Back to sleep. Now I want the pillows back. Don't you think I'm entitled to them? Oh, what's your point, Captain? Where are the drawers? At the house? No, we brought them in here for evidence. The drawers and all the bedding that was in them. What's the point? Let me show you. In my office. Uh, is she in there? Yes, yeah, she's in there. Well, I don't know if I want to talk to her. You don't have to talk to her, Mrs. Gonzalez. Got them over on the table. Huh? 
Hello, Mel. Hello. Call Baker. Here they are. The pillows are right under the sheets. That's where I... Uh, could... Just a minute, Miss Gonzalez, sir. Uh, I'll do it. Well, they're my pillows, after all. Now, look, man. Miss Lucas didn't know the pillows were there. You take them out, and they lower the place where the baby slept about three or four inches. Yeah. With them down that much lower, there was plenty of room for them to breathe when the yellow blanket was pulled tight over the top. You put them back, and they're up pretty close to the yellow blanket. Close enough to cause trouble. What, what kind of trouble? Mrs. Lucas, would you come here a minute? I asked what kind of trouble. Look, I'm tired. I'm awfully tired. I know. Mrs. Lucas, did you know these two pillows were in the drawers? What two pillows? These. No. How'd they get there? I never saw them. I put them there last night. I wanted the babies to be more comfortable. Didn't you see that they were sleeping a little higher than usual? No, I really didn't. You mean that I caused the babies to smother me? That's right, you did. Oh, dear God. Dear God. All right. Sit down, Miss Gonzalez. I love them. I love them so, Ruth. You know I love them. I know. I wouldn't do that for anything in the world. Forgive me. Please forgive me. Please. Oh, Mary, I forgive you. It wasn't your fault. Accidents happen. Twenty-first precinct, Sergeant Klein. Yes, sir. What's the address? Two o five, two o nine. Inside. In front of the shoemaker. Uh, what's the trouble there? What does the man have? And so it goes what's around the clock through the week, every day, every year. The police precinct in the city of New York is a flesh and blood merry-go-round. Anyone can catch the brass ring, or the brass ring can catch anyone. The incidents portrayed on tonight's 21st precinct occurred last year. Names were changed to protect the interests of persons involved. 21st precinct is presented with the official cooperation of the Patrolman's Benevolent Association, an organization of more than 20,000 members of the Police Department, City of New York. Everett Sloan, in the role of Captain Kennelly, Ken Lynch is Lieutenant King. Featured in tonight's cast were Joan Loring and Barbara Weeks, 